Uh, last week we introduced uh, this topic on prayer and uh, we were talking uh, and saying that prayer is not the obligation of the believer or the duty uh, but rather better understood as a gift to believers. It is because of the graciousness of God towards us uh, that uh, prayer has been made available. It's like an invitation for us to respond and a Illustration I used last week and uh, was of my granddaughter who, um, when I get a cuddle from her, uh, I pick her up, right? She can't cuddle me without my action prior to. So I have to pick her up. I'm embracing her in my arms and then I feel her little arms around my neck and on my shoulder and she embraces back. It's a response to my action towards her in the first place. And she can't even support herself. I mean, she's holding on as if she's, uh, you know, holding on for dear life. You know, she feel her little arms around. If I let go, she would fall, right? I'm not going to let go. I'm going to hold. Well, you said an illustration here of uh, our prayer and our relationship with our Father, right? He embraces us through the work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf and by the Spirit who uh, adopts us into his family so that we can call him Abba Father. And prayer then is a gift, all right? It's our response to him. It's that invitation uh, that comes from him in Christ. And now we return that uh, in prayer. So prayer is a gift, an invitation to participate in the life of the triune God. And prayer is our response to God's embrace. I mean, this is where life, and for that matter, death, makes sense. Right? We are centered, we find ourselves centered in life, in the place of prayer. It's there that we gain our bearings. Like ships navigating waters, having to watch out for rocky outcrops, right? Dangerous waters. How do we navigate life? It's through prayer. It's there that we find our center. It's there that we find who we are, who God is than what he is doing. Prayer centers us in the plan and purposes of God for our lives. I use the illustration of my granddaughter. Let me use another illustration here to talk about our response uh, to God's holding us, grasping hold of us, embracing us. Uh, Paul speaks of that in Philippians Uh, when he talks about the Christian life, he'll say this, and not that I've already obtained all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now he's speaking of more than just prayer, but prayer is an integral part of the, the Christian life and response to the graciousness of God. Paul's saying, Jesus has grabbed hold of me. And I'm holding him to take all of that for the purpose for which he's initially taken hold of me. And we find that in prayer. Another illustration of this idea of responding to that grasp and grasping back, if you like, embracing back, is that of of an athlete uh, in a running race. And Paul will say this in the Corinthians, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it, that you might grasp hold of it. And so our response back is not a passive case, sarah, sarah, whatever it be, God's got hold of me, but we embrace him. We hold after him because here life makes sense. Here we get our bearings. Here we get our center. Here we can see what it is that God is doing in and through us. Well, I want us to reflect today on 
a really astonishing a, a prayer of Jesus. It's a prayer that he makes from the cross. And what I'm wanting to talk about here today is uh, last week we talked about a call to prayer. This week we're going to talk about authentic prayer. And we're going to use Jesus in, as a, uh, our example here today to get a window on understanding what prayer is like. And this is a prayer that Jesus makes from the cross. Now I'm going to read it um, here. It's not going to be my main text, uh, but this prayer of Jesus evokes another passage, another prayer that comes from our Old Testament, and that's what we're going to look at here today. But at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? What an outstanding, astonishing prayer. Think about that. This is the prayer of the eternal Son of God. Incarnate now in human flesh, but born of the Spirit. At his baptism, filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, ministered in the fullness of the Spirit. And here in crisis on the cross, experiences the absence of the presence of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the crisis of the cross experiences the absence of the presence of God. Now I want us to look at this prayer here today, as astonishing as it is, as an example of authentic faith in action. Jesus uh, in this prayer quotes the opening line of Psalm 22. It's an individual psalm of lament or complaint. And it's the most fitting prayer for him to pray because of how these prayers functioned in ancient Israel and functioned also in the life of Jesus and of the early church. Now these prayers had certain characteristics and Psalm 22, which I'm going to read from here as our text today, um, has some of the characteristics, not all of them of these sorts of psalms, but has some of them. Uh, there's a cry or an address to God for help. We'll find that there's an affirmation of trust, a confidence that God is able to respond. And then we find a description of suffering. Sometimes enemies are involved, as we find in this case, the psalmist or the prayer uh, himself or herself, and then Yahweh, uh, God, is mentioned. There's a series of petitions where the psalmist asks God to act. And then a vow of praise that knowing and sensing God's answer to this, that they vow that they would praise God amongst the brothers. So let us open our Bibles here at Psalm 22, and I'm not going to read the entire psalm, but I will cue you as I do read it. So let's open our hearts here to hear Scripture read to us. Psalm 22. I'll let you find it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. The affirmation of trust, verse 3. 
Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And in you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. We're going to look at the description of the present suffering that's articulated here in the prayer. I'm going to pick it up from verse 7. And I want you just to think about that scene around the cross. And that's what makes this psalm so appropriate as be a prayer here of Jesus. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Verse 19, part of the petition here. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. An example of the vow praise, verse 22. And I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that by your spirit, uh, who brought your word into being, that you would use this word not only to teach us about you and what it is that you're doing in the world, but to transform, to shape our own lives so that we can participate more effectively in your life and in your purposes and your mission. Have your way in our hearts, we pray, through your word and your spirit today. In Jesus we ask. Amen. Amen. Now, some of you may be aware of these uh, psalms. Some of you may not um, here. But as I said, this is a psalm of lament or a psalm of complaint. And you might be surprised to know that these are the most common types of psalms in the Psalter. You might think of the psalms and we think of celebrations of God's goodness. But actually the most common psalm there is a lament psalm. And of those lament psalms, there are community to laments and there are individual laments. Now, these psalms, while individual, were still prayed in the community. They took place in the, as part of the community life of ancient Israel and can function today within the community life of God's people, his church. That is, people aren't there praying this alone, they're praying this within the context of people around them, supporting them. But they are a prayer of lament or of complaint. An Old Testament scholar by the name of Brueggemann uh, calls these psalms of disorientation. When life gets turned upside down, where it seems like we can't make sense, we thought we were walking this way and the path was clear before us and then a curveball comes, to use a baseball or a softball analogy, right? A strange bounce of the ball if it's going to be a football, right? Those oval balls, they bounce all over the place. You think you're going to pick it up and bang, it's off to the side. The curveball comes, the odd bounce comes, and we find ourselves disorientated. 
It's not what we had forecast for our lives, right? It's not what we had planned and strategized for. We had this plan in place. We thought we heard what God was doing, and all of a sudden we find ourselves spiraling around because of the circumstances that are unfolding. And these psalms function to help the people of God become reorientated, right? It helps them by first acknowledging the disorientation. Brueggemann also uh, notes here and and, um, laments, if you like, the loss of lament within the Christian context. Writing around the turn of the century, the last century here, he said, The Christian church has lost the ability to lament. We've lost the ability to grieve when it's necessary to grieve. And look, I'm very thankful for being part of the Christian tradition uh, that I'm in, uh, within the Pentecostal tradition um, here. I think there's something that captures the very essence of what God is doing today within this tradition. But one of the weaknesses... Let me tell you, in the broader community, one of the weaknesses here that is often said uh, is that we can become happy clappy. You know what I mean by happy clappy? Right? Leave your problems at the door. Come in here and worship the Lord. Celebrate. And sadly, you know, I've mentioned this before in a sermon, some people in these contexts, when their world becomes disorientated, feel like they cannot fit. There's no place for me. Because you're celebrating and I'm grieving. You're talking about the wonders of God and how he's answered your prayer, but I'm here. God, why have you forsaken me? I'm feeling a place of despair. And not intentionally, not intentionally, but we can lead or project a life, well, that is sort of like Disneyland. It's not authentic. And look, we can slip into it so easy. I mean, I can remember teaching this uh, to a class and then uh, one of the, 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 um, the ladies in the class became a pastor uh, and then I was talking with her uh, at one uh, minister's meeting. I was asking, look, how are you doing? And she started to talk about the challenges that she was having with her daughter. And you know what I said? Oh, the Lord will make it, turn it to good in the end. And she looked at me and her eyes kind of rolled because I actually used that illustration in class. And then, you know, the pride in me, oh, no, no, I'm serious. God will. I should have just said, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, we slip into it so easily. We put out these flippant responses, you know, these these, uh, trivialising responses. But do you know what it does? Let's say that Joe is going, undergoing a very traumatic event and he's trying to communicate. He's saying, where's where's God in this? And I say, look, God's going to sort it out. Have faith, Joe. You know what I've just done? I've denied his personhood. I've trivialised his situation in life. I might not have intended to do it, right? It might not have been my my intention, but I have minimised his personhood. Aren't you thankful today, that God does not minimize you. 
he does not trivialise your life experience. He does not trivialise your brokenness, your emotional turmoil. These prayers are there in the Bible to empower us, to give voice to us when we're walking through periods of disorientation. Who are these prayers prayed to, after all? To the only one who can center us. To the only one who can help us make sense of the turmoil that we're in. They direct us back to the one who has created us and redeemed us and who can bring his purposes to fruition in our life. I'm going to use a personal example here. 25 years ago, thereabouts, I was in pastoral ministry. Uh, it was at the, uh, what is now the White House, but it was before it was the Victoria Park Foursquare, and then we'd moved to Bentley. I was in the pastoral role alongside uh, Tom Whitaker, who we see here, part of the church. And I went through, and some of you were with us then, Mrs. Phillips, you were there, part of the congregation at that time. Many of us, you were there at that time. I went through the most painful experience, emotional experience in my life. They call it, it's, it's in helping professions, it's one of the dangers. It's called burnout. Sometimes people talk about it as breakdown. I went through emotional burnout. It was the most painful experience. Somebody said, oh, Chris, I don't feel that you're letting us down uh, through this time. I didn't feel like I was letting people down. I felt I had been let down by those around me and by God himself. I couldn't talk about it with breaking into tears. So painful it was. There was a psalm that helped me through that. It was another psalm of lament, Psalm uh, 100, uh, sorry, Psalm 13. You don't need to turn there. I'll read it from you. The psalm opens this way. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? You know, in that place of crisis, and I thought, God, you've done a baddie on me. <laughs> you've, you've kind of slipped a, slipped a, you know, a, a little, uh, slipped me a banana when I was hoping for an orange. You know, I've gone, I've gone for a for a skate on this. Where were you when when this started to break in my spirit? You know, God wasn't there. <gasps> Chris, how dare you? I'm shocked that you might ever think that. <laughs> Where is your faith? Oh. We might even not even know it at times. You know, my granddaughter might even not even know it. She might be in great despair. Her world, her little world, shaking, crying. But I've got her in my arms. I've got her in my arms. She might not know it. She might not sense it. But I've got her in my arms. My Heavenly Father 
had me in his arms. I couldn't see it. I didn't experience. I looked about and it seemed like he wasn't present. Why, there was someone that we've spoken about already on a cross being mocked and despised who cried the same thing. Authentic prayer. And God has provided these prayers for us, as I said, to articulate, to voice, to empower the the powerless, to enable us to speak out the one who is actually able to work in our lives. You know, it was for me, it was a gradual process. It took a couple of years, to be honest with you. I'll be honest with you here. It took me a couple of years. Sometimes it would be a conflict, and I'd feel that saying giving away in my spirit. I can remember sitting in a classroom, not teaching it, and just a question or a challenge came up from within the class, and I could feel that coming away in my spirit, you know, that giving away again, that brokenness in my emotions. Uh, I'm not healed yet. Right. It took time. It took time. How long, O oh Lord? You know, these prayers, some have said, are a prayer of somebody who has no faith. They are weak in faith. I'd like to challenge that here today. Our Lord on the cross was not one who was weak in faith, but it is strong in faith. It is one who understands that even though it seems that God is not present, who else is there to go to? Father, I cry out to you. Where are you in my situation? It is not the cry or the prayer of one without faith. It is the prayer of great faith, astounding faith, that turns to the only one who can orientate us in that crisis. It is entrusting our lives to the one who judges justly. First Peter, reflecting on Jesus and his suffering, says, look, Jesus is an example for us. And I'm going to read here from uh, First Peter. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read First Peter uh, chapter 2. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Oh, we don't like that verse. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. And not only in suffering, though, but in how to pray, how to orientate ourselves in the midst of suffering uh, so that you might follow his steps. He committed no sin. You know, there's a a tragic account once. I I was studying with a, a guy around my same age in Bible college. I hadn't seen him for a few years, and I saw him later, and she said, look, where, where are you going? How, how are things? He said, oh, look, uh, you know, my walk's in shambles. Um, you know, there was a crisis, I think, in his marriage. I it may have dealt with uh, medical issues as well. He said, I couldn't see God at it anymore, and, and, there, and then he was off wandering uh, in a wilderness. And I thought, how tragic, the very place You know, sometimes in life, we can work out ways around things. You know, the problem's not that bad. We can see this person, we can talk to that person, and we can navigate around and and make things work. But there are some points, and ultimately the main point in life, you can't navigate without God. Where else are you going to go? Who else are you going to turn to? And Jesus Here we're told, he who committed no sin, neither deceit was found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself 
to the one who judges justly. Entrusting himself. Well, how does he do that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the same as the prayer. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a chaos. We're in disorientation. God, bring about your kingdom life here and now. Soon. (laughs) How long, Lord? But we need your kingdom power manifest in our midst. Amen? We need God to act. Because if he doesn't, we're lost. If he doesn't, we're lost. Well, these Psalms empower us. And we do not suffer alone. Jesus suffered alone so that we do not need to. You hear that? Jesus suffered alone so that we don't have to. Our Father heard Jesus' prayer. You say he still died. Our Father heard Jesus. Jesus' prayer. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who could save him from death. See, the Bible knows nothing of the silent sufferer. To his accusers, he was silent, but to God, He cried loudly to his father with loud cries and prayers and supplications to him who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. God heard Jesus cry on the cross. And the power of the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead for all time. Our Father heard Jesus' prayer, raising him from the dead for all time. Our Father will hear your prayer. Look, there's a truth when we say that God will work all things to the good. And at the end of the age, God will fulfill his purposes for humanity and for creation. This life won't be as good as it gets. The best is yet to come. But one of the positive things that I can say about our Christian tradition, uh, I'm talking here about the Pentecostal tradition, and that is the acknowledgement, that is the awareness that we're just not holding the fort to the kingdom is fully established. God's kingdom is advancing on earth, even as we speak, even with the words uh, that we are, we are saying here today. He is manifesting his power here now. While we may need to wait until the end, to the, to the eschaton, when uh, Jesus returns and brings everything uh, back into uh, uh, final order, even now, uh, Jesus didn't have to wait to the end to be raised from the dead. God did that in history, and it is the conviction here of the early church and in our tradition here today, that we do not need to wait until the end for God to answer our prayer powerfully and to change and transform our circumstances. I did not have to wait until the eschaton to be healed of emotional burnout. I did not have to wait until the end to be healed of the anxiety where I used to just nibble on my nails until there was no nails left. And then I nibbled on the skin until there was no skin left because I was so anxious. That was a way of dealing with that anxiety. I didn't have to wait to the eschaton. God healed me now. In fact, that was about 20, 30 odd years ago. But he healed me now. He's at business now. He is able to change our circumstances now. I didn't have to wait to the end to be delivered of a foul mouth. 
God could change what was happening in my mind and what I would speak and heal me instantaneously in conversion from that. I didn't have to wait until the end to be delivered from a fear of public speaking. God could do that in my life over a process, but could do that in my life. You do not have to wait until the end for God to change and transform your circumstances. Yes, he will at the end, but he's doing a work today. You hear him? He's doing a work today. Our authentic prayers can go forth today. God, where are you in my circumstance? And he can hear that and he can do a work to transform that today or over the coming weeks. The kingdom of God is being manifest in our midst. Church, we need to be authentic with our prayers. Our prayers do not need to just be extolling God for his goodness and his greatness. Why, we should do that because he is good and he is great. But we do not need to deny or try and hide the pain that we might be going through in our life. Who else is going to sort it out? There is only one and he invites you as the Father embraces us. Let us embrace him with all that we have today. Amen. Let us ask God come into the recesses of my emotional being, right? Into my family relationships, into my workplace. God, let your kingdom come because it's needed. You're the only one who can orientate this and make it work. You do not have to continue to journey on in pain, suffering silently, thinking that you're doing God a favor. That is not the gospel that our Lord is wanting to proclaim here today. It's not what he proclaimed in the years ago. He has not changed. He's doing a work. There's a verse in chapter uh, uh, of, of Romans chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those with weep who weep. And someone made the comment, and it's given Brueggemann's comment about our, ability, uh, our lack of ability. We've lost the ability to lament. Uh, We do the rejoicing with those who rejoice quite well. We don't quite do as well weeping with those who weep. I'm going to call our musicians uh, up here uh, at this point.